All right, in this video, it's time to get our new drum input class all wired in and hooked up to the game's input system. We'll need to address things like, one, making sure that we have a set of dictionaries set up to handle drum buttons, and make sure our input system is able to update and read input from our new drum input class. We'll also need to handle things like a new type of input binding for a config file so that we can bind buttons specifically to the Rock Band 2 controller. Okay. So, to get everything started, we'll turn our attention to the input class. So over here inside of our Solution Explorer, we'll navigate up to Core, where we have our main input class. If we bring up this class and scroll down a little bit, you see we have the definition for the class, Map Set. The Map Set, of course, contains all of the dictionaries relevant to different types of input. So currently, the second dictionary in place is actually an array of dictionaries. We have four dictionaries that reference in integers to various input data. Now we need to do the exact same thing for the drum input. The idea is that they're based on game pads, there could be up to four of them, so we're going to need to make another dictionary, or excuse me, array of dictionaries, with four dictionaries actually created that we're going to call drum maps. So we'll copy just to get things kicked off a little bit faster, we'll copy our gamepad maps dictionary array and we'll change its name to drum maps. And again, in order to alleviate the problem of using element, excuse me, enumeration elements as keys, we're just going to be casting everything to int. So this dictionary array will be of type int and then input data. So just looking up input data elements based on number. We'll have four of these, so our integer, excuse me, array size will be four. Mm -hmm. Now, we do need to make sure that four actual dictionaries get created after we set up our array. So we'll jump down here inside of MapSet, MapSet's constructor, and we'll copy the current line that is initializing all of our gamepad map dictionaries. We'll copy and duplicate the for statement that is currently looking at the number of gamepad maps we currently have. Let's do the exact same thing for drum maps. So we'll loop over the number of drum maps. And then for each drum map, we'll make sure that that drum map, or drum maps sub i, is equal to a new dictionary of type int key and input data as value. So that'll take care of setting up a new dictionary set to handle input specifically for our drums. All right, moving on from here, we now need to make sure that our input class is able to listen out for events coming in from the drum input class. So down here inside of initialize, we'll jump in right below our gamepad handling, and we'll drop two new event handlers in place. We'll begin with button release from the drum input class. So that's drum input dot button release plus equals tab to accept the new delegate, tab again to accept the name of the handler, and we are left with drum input underscore button release. Now we'll do the same thing for button press, drum input dot button press, plus equals tab for the delegate, tab again for the method handler. Now we have button press, button release, and their relative handlers. Then just to keep everything straight, we'll draw down a quick comment saying that these are our Rock Band 2 drums. Then just to keep everything in order here inside of the input class, I'm going to move these, so I'll actually cut them and move them down to the very bottom right after our gamepad handlers. Alright, so with our new handlers, we need to turn around and make sure we code in the necessary lookups so that the moment we see a button, we check to see if it is bound and then fire off the necessary input event. So what we'll do is a scenario very similar to GamePad because once again we have the same type of dictionary, the same number of dictionaries, and we're going to be looking up a specific dictionary based on an incoming player index. So let's take a look at doing that here inside of drum input underscore button press. We'll begin with a local variable to store the input data struct. So we have input data called input data. Then we'll do a check. Basically we want to look up the correct dictionary and ask it if the incoming button 
happens to be present in that dictionary. Now, of course, before we get to a specific dictionary, we need to look up the dictionary itself out of the overall players array. So let's put together an if statement and combine all of these things. So what we're going to do is we'll look at current map set. And then inside of current map set, we are interested in the drum maps array. Now inside of drum maps, we need to look up a specific drum map by player. So we need to pass in player index and use that to look up a, a given element. Player index is of type player index, so it has to be casted over to int to be used in the array lookup. Now once this element has been looked up, we'll be looking at a specific dictionary inside of drum maps, so just one drum map dictionary. We can then ask that drum map dictionary to issue a call to the try get value method. And then in try get value, we'll pass the incoming button on to the dictionary, and if it finds that button, then it'll pass the relevant input data struct out to our input data variable. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll pass in button. But of course, button is going to need to be casted to an int value to be read in as the key for the dictionary. And then we'll specify the parameter out input data. So input, correct a slight bit of spelling there, and we'll have access to input data. Then that will finish off our call to try get value. One more closing parenthesis to take care of our if statement, and then we can drop in some braces for the if statement itself. So if after looking up in a specific dictionary, we find the button has been bound and has been pressed, we will issue out a call to the input pressed event from inside of input. Yeah, that makes sense. So we turn around and fire the input pressed event, passing along the input data struct. I mean, generally, this is all stuff we've done before. Yes, this, and then really, this is just nothing more than a review of how we had set up the gamepad, because exactly the same kind of mm -hmm. lookup took place. But again, just showing step by step how it assembles into our drum setup. Now, for button release, we can leverage just copying this information out and dropping it in place over button release for drum input. And the only thing we should have to change is the event that we fire. We'll fire off input released in the case that we had just released a drum button. The actual lookup will occur in the same manner. So looking here, all of this is looking good for our handler methods. One last thing we need to do here inside of input is make sure that we issue update calls to the drum input class. So up here inside of input, inside, or excuse me, update inside of our input class, we'll put together a second for loop that does basically the same thing as our gamepad for loop. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to steal that for loop and duplicate it, and instead loop over the drum maps array. So we'll simply swap out gamepad maps for drum maps. And then when we issue calls, we'll call out to drum input dot update plus uh, passing in the index variable i of course casted to a player index all right with that that should be everything we need to take care of inside of input just out of habit i'm going to build make sure everything gets saved out from input and we are not seeing any syntax errors so moving on now that we've got the drum input set up all wired into our input system we now need a way to get data loaded into our drum maps dictionary. Because of course, if we look at the way input binding is work, working, key binds end up in a key map. The gamepad maps end up in one of the gamepad map dictionaries. But we now need a small section of code that will let drum inputs get bound in one of our drum maps dictionaries. So to do that, let's first set up the way we would like our inputs bound, inputs bound on the drum controller. We'll jump directly into our config XML file and begin putting some settings together. We'll begin here inside of the global input section inside of our config file and we'll put together a series of inputs. Again, inside of global input we're just looking for stuff that functions the same across all the different kinds of screens inside the game. As a matter of fact, we're going to be using the same set of inputs that the current gamepad is, meaning our basic inputs of start and back to advance forwards and backwards in menus, 
than our up, down, left, and right directional values. Mm -hmm. We want to have the same kind of bindings on our drum controller. Now, since the drum controller has a struct all to its own, or rather an enumeration all to its own, we do need to have a, spe a special dedicated set of inputs for it. Now, to get kind of a head start in creating those inputs, I'm going to copy the entire section currently assigned to gamepad bind, mm -hmm. paste it all in here inside of global input, and then rename each of the sections to drum bind. So very briefly, I'm going to jump through all of these nodes in our config file and change them to drum bind nodes. Of course, everything else is going to follow the same pattern with our series of fields for port, input device, and so on. And in this case, our device inputs just so happen to match these names. We can very briefly turn our attention back to drum state and note the fact that our drum buttons enum does have d-pad up, down, left, right, start, and back. So all of these should bind directly, just as they are. Now one thing I will do, I will change here, is just looking at our input configuration. Currently we have a standard controller hooked up to port 0, or rather port 1, on the computer, and we have the drum controller hooked up to port 2. So these being 0 based means that all of our drum binds are going to need to be pointed at port 1 in order to read the actual drum controller. Alright, now that we've got the global input, let's take a look at the game specific input that we're going to want to use with our drum controller. So down here inside of game input, let's see, I think this time I'm going to start off with only a single node and we'll base everything off of this node. Now once again we're going to be calling these types of nodes drum bind nodes looking at port 1. Now in the case of game input these are the actual drums that are going to be linked up to notes so these are all of the drums that we had set up in our drum button struct so red drum, yellow drum and so on. So that means the the way we want to set these up is so that we do advance in data so basically we just bind tracks 1 through 8 or 0 through 7 if we're looking at them here in the config file. So beginning at track 0, that's very top track, and that's going to be the symbol track. So the drum we would like to bind to that is the green symbol. And we can probably pull these columns back a little bit. Just glancing over here, we probably can do something along the lines of that. Two spaces in between, because the next symbol coming up is going to be the yellow symbol. So what we've got so far is a drum bind node on port 1. The device input is green symbol. The game input is note. We're going to set these up for player 2, and the data here is 0, indicating track 1. Now we can take this line, and we can probably duplicate it 7 more times. And that should give us all of our different tracks. We can verify that by beginning, uh, by setting up the data field. So we have track 0, track 1, track 2, 3, four, five, six, and seven. And now it becomes clear why we skipped four, uh, what, four and five in our previous setup? Right, in our gamepad bindings we simply ran out of uh, buttons. We had set up the game to handle things like symbols, mm -hmm. and we didn't have a controller with enough buttons to handle symbols. Right. Here, now we do. We can see that everything nicely fills out all eight tracks of input. So, looking at this, we need to go in here and looking over everything, yep, all of this should work. So, beginning with, we've got a green symbol, let's move on to yellow symbol. So yellow symbol, we'll pull this one space out just to patch up our columns. So yellow symbol is going to be bound to track 1, and really what this means is yellow symbol is going to function as our hi-hat inside of the game. Alright, moving on from here we have track 2, which is the snare. Snare is going to be used as the red drum. So we've got red drum, fill out our column. Moving on from red drum, we have track 3, which is going to be the first tom. So we could call this the uh, high tom. We're going to use the yellow drum in this case. And this is the point where things do start to differ a little bit from Rock Band. Mm -hmm. or in classic Rock Band, the yellow drum is actually the hi-hat. 
So in this case, we get to leverage the fact that we now have a symbol to dedicate to the hi-hat. Which makes more sense. And then an entirely separate drum so we can actually gain an extra tom in addition to everything else. Very cool. All right, so moving on from yellow drum, next we have is going to be the blue drum. So basically the next three drums are going to be the three toms. So yellow drum, blue drum, and then finally green drum. And that should take care of all of our toms. So those will be bound to tracks three, four, and five. Track six is going to be for the kick. So we'll simply drop in kick as the drum. And finally, we have track seven, which is going to be set up as the ride track inside of the game. And we'll use the final symbol available on the Rock Band 2 controller. So that will be blue symbol. And you can see this is one of the places where having a specific enumeration set up for our drums makes it very easy to identify things in the binding, meaning that binding our drum controller is possibly the easiest device to bind, since even the gamepad has things like A and X, which to a musician wouldn't directly correlate to a specific drum. Here we can see exactly what drums we're binding to what tracks. All right, that'll take care of in-game input. One last section we want to address is menu input. We would like to be able to navigate the menus using the drums just like we would in a classic rock band game. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is let's steal one of the lines from the game section. Let's actually steal the red drum. So grabbing red drum, I'm going to jump in and paste it here into the menu input section. So we'll do a drum bind on port 1 for the red drum, only the input is going to be the back input. So basically red drum will be back. And for our data, we're not worried about tracks, so we'll just leave this as 0. And looking at our padding, at this point the padding has gotten a little bit crazy with all the different kinds of input. We'll probably leave it the same as the above section. We could line it up later if we needed to. But for the time being, we have one of our drums for menu navigation. Let's copy this and paste it three additional times to take care of the rest of our directions. We also need to go up and down. We'll jot these down here. We need back, up, down, and select. Then for our drums, the drum for up is going to be the yellow drum. For down is going to be the blue drum. And select is going to be the green drum. And now we do need to patch up the columns a little bit. Pull that back. Not that far. And then we'll set these columns. Actually, what column was this on? That's looking at column 70. There we go. So a little bit of weaving back and forth, but then again, that was happening in the key binding anyway. All right, with all of our inputs set up here, we now have global inputs, we have game inputs, and we have menu inputs for our drum bindings. So the last piece of the puzzle is an additional piece of code inside of our config class that will handle loading in drum binding lines or drum binding nodes. I do want to make sure that this file gets saved out, so we'll explicitly save it here, config.xml. Okay. And then we'll turn our attention to the config class. So if we look down here inside of game and load up config, we can scroll down to the load input section. Actually, more specific than load input, let's actually address load map set. So where we're looking at loading in input bindings. Now, the second type of in input binding available is gamepad input and does the following resolution look using enum.parse and pulling everything out so we can add it into the specific map set. Now, since this code is so close in nature to the drum input code that we need, I'm actually going to copy the entire ELSIF that's currently used for gamepad bind, copy it and paste it to duplicate it, and then change just a few of the 
individual types used. The first is we'll change the name that's used to trigger this kind of binding. That's going to be drum input. So any drum input node is going to fall into here. Now we're gaining a button, resolving that using enum.parse. Now in order to resolve the name over to a specific integer value, we do need to know the type of enumeration. And rather than uh, buttons, this is going to be drum buttons. So we'll resolve the correct number out of the enumeration. Then when we go to store the value, we're actually wanting to store it in drum maps, not in gamepad maps. Now port and button can remain the same, and the rest of the input data struct assembly can remain the same. The last thing we need is we do need to make sure that we pass that button along to the drum input so that drum input is aware of what buttons are bound. So we need to look at drum input, the drum input class, call add button, but we need to cast the button number over to a drum buttons type rather than button. And that'll satisfy the call for add button and everything should get passed along nicely. Okay. Now at this point, if everything has worked and all of our connections have been made successfully, we should actually be able to see some input from the Rock Band to controller inside of the game itself. So let's try things out. Loading up the game, let's go down to free play mode so that we can test hitting some various buttons. I'll begin by hitting the uh, kick pedal and we can see that at the moment we are not seeing any kick inputs so we'll spend just a moment. This is actually not surprising given the amount of layers of input that we're going through. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is just a very quick debug through some of our input, beginning at the input cl class itself. We want to make sure that inside of input we of course have our handlers and we need to make sure that input is getting down to this point. So we'll set a breakpoint inside of drum input button press. So running the game, we'll load up free play, we'll begin hitting the controller, not seeing anything yet so we're not actually getting over to that point. So we'll step one level further back into drum input itself and make sure that we are looking at all of our various bound buttons. So jumping in here, we see that we are not actually looping over bound buttons, which is very interesting. With the game running, still running in the bottom, let's set a breakpoint on our for loop. Ah, and we see that we do break out to our for loop. So what's happening here? Bound buttons count is set to zero. Mm. That would indeed be a problem. So as far as the drum input's concerned, we don't even have any buttons bound yet. So that seems to be the source of our trouble. So what that means is more than likely, add button isn't getting called properly. And if we set a breakpoint around the game, we can see that it is indeed not. No buttons are getting sent off to drum input. So that now points the finger at config. So that means we are either not getting into this section or something isn't happening correctly here. Let's set a breakpoint here inside of drum input. And if we run the game, we see that no, we do indeed get no calls down here. So let's take a look at these node names. This now traces out to the config file. And we're calling these drum bind lines, and I think I see the, the problem. Versus drum input. Drum bind, and here looking at drum input. Yep. So there was the break in the connection. So we'd called these, it was just a simple confusion of drum input since that had been used so commonly elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We are indeed looking at drum bind nodes, not drum input nodes, so that should be the source of our trouble. So let's jump in and run the game. Now I'm not sure what other breakpoints might still be set, so be prepared for the game to accidentally dump out at any given moment. So here inside the game, if we hit the button, ah, very nice. Now the only last thing we're getting is that too many hits are being pressed. <laughs> yeah. So, I'd say so. So what's happening is it looks like we're continually getting new events over and over again. So let's take a look at drum input and see where that might be coming from. So looking here at button press, we're looking at the current drum state is the button down, and is the last drum state is the button up for the given button. Now the only last thing to look over there would possibly be the drum state code itself, because I mean that's looking, I mean that looks right for the input. Currently down, last is up, drum states. Ah, and I think I see the problem. Inside of last drum states, we are never actually updating last drum states. If we look at the end of our for loop, 
we leave out and we never update that uh, struct. So what's happening is, of course, every time this button down on the last one wasn't, because we never set the last one. So the last one was always up. There you go. So let's patch this up real quick by doing a simple last drum states. And then we want to reference the current one based on our call. So I'm just going to copy this int cast result player index. So drum states player um, sub player index. We'll say that that is equal to the current drum state. And that should take care of updating the state in the last state and prepare it for the check in the next state. So let's build and run. Jump into free play. And let's try the kick pedal one more time. Ah, very nice. Pressing the kick pedal results in precisely one hit of the kick drum. So, with that working now, the next thing that would come to mind would be testing all of the various drums, though at the moment, we're not necessarily going to get drum hits off of all of our various drums. The reason is, if you remember back inside of our drum state, that was left as a very simple state. Matter of fact, looking at drum state, all we're binding up is the kick button, start, back, right, and left. Right, we still have to decode some of those other drums. So that means here inside of free play, we should be able to pause the game, and we can by hitting the start button. We should be able to jump out by hitting the back button, so those work. So, so far, buttons on the controller are start, back, and the kick pedal. Now, like you were saying, we do have the more complex job of decoding the various combinations. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll save that for the next video, because so far we have made it quite far in this video. We've got our new class all set up. We've got our input system set up with the appropriate dictionaries and event handlers to take care of drum input. We've got various bindings set up in our config file for drum bindings. Config is now correctly handling drum bindings. And we even took a quick detour down the debugging path to figure out where a few breaks in the pipeline had occurred. Sure, it happens. But with all of those patched up now, we now have our drum input well on its way. Only one step remaining. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video.